who you who you on? You're on him or me? You. Okay. Hello and welcome to Radio Vision. My name is Bernard White. We have a special guest today who's written a book entitled Hubert Harrison, The Voice of Harlem Radicalism from 1883 to 1918. Now many of you, and I know I'm one, among, one amongst them, have only recently heard or don't know anything about who Hubert Harrison is. Well, at the end of this discussion, you should have a pretty good idea of who he is and begin to wonder how come, or maybe you'll know, why so many people don't know about Hubert Harrison. Uh, in the beginning of the book here, it says Hubert, Hubert Harrison was an immensely skilled writer, orator, educator, critic, and political activist who more than any other political leader of his era combined class consciousness and anti-white supremacist race consciousness into a coherent political radicalism. Harrison's ideas profoundly influenced new Negro militants, including A. Philip Randolph and Marcus Garvey, and his synthesis of class and race issues is a key unifying link between the two great trends of the black liberation movement. The labor and civil rights-based work of Martin Luther King and the race, nas race and nationalist platform associated with Malcolm X. And this is a book, and uh, hopefully at the end of this conversation, you'll run out and get a copy. Well, hello, uh, Jeff Barry. Hi, Bernard. Thank you, you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, how did you find this guy, and w w what did you do to come across him? Uh, briefly, uh, I'm a product of the 60s. I was influenced by those movements, keyed by the civil rights, black liberation struggle, which influenced all the other movements of the 60s. Student movement, the anti-war movement, the labor movement. I actually worked 33 years in the trade union movement, you know, so. Um, and along the way, as I started getting politically involved, I came to the conclusion, I came to understand the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy as we tried to work for a, a better society. It's just crucial. It's the key thing, I think, that the ruling class relies upon to maintain control, and it's the issue we have to take on in this society. So I set out, while working in the post office, I worked over in Jersey City in the big 4,000 worker uh, bulk mail center where I was elected the union head for a number of years. And uh, I, I started to research the various left groups approach to what is variously called the race national question, starting from the turn of the 20th century, to see if there were any lessons could be learned that would help us in our efforts today. And I was familiar with virtually everything. I'm a pretty serious researcher. This book took 30 years, right? And um, I, um, I had read virtually all the, the pronouncements on that topic up through about 1930. In the process, I came across two books by Hubert Harrison at the Schomburg Center. His first book, The Negro and the Nation, written in 1917. His second book, When Africa Awakes, written in 1920. And as I read them on microfilm, because that's the way they were accessible at the time, I printed them out and I took them home and I read them. And I was just arrested by the clarity of his thought. I was familiar with all his contemporaries and he just stood head and shoulders above everybody and I said, who is this guy? And uh, so then I set about trying to find out what I could. And I was a few hundred pages into a, um, uh, I had been a few hundred pages into my other, it was a dissertation while I was working in the Postal Service under Nathan Huggins and uh, Hollis Lynch, two outstanding scholars, right? And um, I dropped everything and I said, I want to write on this fella. So I put together a few hundred pages on Harrison and then uh, computers were in their infancy still, the small ones anyway. I remember when they were black long. And um, I sent the same letter out to about 25 different places and a librarian from the Virgin Islands wrote back and said she was related to the family. I tracked down the son and daughter who was still alive at the time. This is in the early 1980s. Son was up on 150th Street off Bradhurst right here in Manhattan. And um, they, you know, I went to meet them and first, why do you want to write about my dad? I understood that, right? About on the third meeting, they took me into the front room where they had preserved all his papers since 1927 and they told me to take them and do what I needed to do with them. So they showed utter confidence and, and trust in me. I proceeded to index, inventory, and preserve them. You know, I spent a considerable sum of money just, you know, because I knew it was more important, you know, that we do that first. Those papers subsequently were placed at Columbia's Rare Book and Manuscript Library. It's the most widely accessed collection at Columbia. I have a web page, my, simply my name, jeffreybperry.net, 
You can link to it. There's a 102-page finding aid. The collection is open to the public. We're also putting all 700 of Harrison's writings on the web, permanent searchable database free. So uh, this is all, but in answer to your question, so I was active. I was clear somewhat, however imperfectly, on the centrality of the question of the fight against white supremacy as we're seeking social change, right? And I came across Harrison a little bit by chance, right? I mean, there had been pieces. J.A. Rogers had written a nice piece. Richard B. Moore had written a very nice piece. J.A. Rogers, Richard B. Moore, Philip Foner had some, some material on Harrison. And I... Uh, I was, uh, you know, I, I set about doing it. So after, uh, after I got the papers, I uh, wound up doing about an 800-page dissertation. This was uh, 20 years ago because it was then the problem was getting it published. This was volume one. And when I finished the dissertation, 800 pages, it only went up the first part of his life. I took his 75-year-old daughter for the New Yorkers. I took her out to B. Smith's restaurant, a little splurge for me, right? And um, as we finished dinner, she reaches into her bag and she goes here and she gives me his diary, which I didn't know existed. And it's a major document because it's all his inner relations with Garvey and people like this. It's a major historical document. So I knew we had two volumes. So then the task was, I went to a publisher. I had, right away I had a, a, a major university publisher say they wanted to publish it. And when I told them two volumes, they almost died. Unknown subject, unknown author. They thought I was crazy. but. Harrison, as, we'll, as we get into this, I think people will see, is one of the true giants, not only of black history, of U.S. history, U.S. radical history, a major figure who um, we have to ask why we didn't know more about him before. I mean, he, he's a giant. I'm quite saying he is that important. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not into metaphysics, but I notice, I notice whenever I try and do some research, things seem to come to you. Yeah. You know, you just begin to find out things that uh, that you hadn't anticipated you yeah. would find in, in yeah. the beginning. So, where where was Harrison born? Harrison's born in Saint Croix in the Virgin Islands. His father had been born enslaved. Saint Croix has an early emancipation for reasons which I go into in the book uh, in 1848. His mother was from Barbados, so she was an immigrant plantation worker in Saint Croix. Um, so that's part of what gives Harrison his breath. He self-defined, he defined himself as a radical internationalist, right? And Harrison was an immigrant in the St. Croix experience because his mom was from Barbados and then when he comes to the U.S. he's an immigrant. So it gives him a certain breath to his perspective, I think. Um, but he comes to New York in 1900 as a 17-year-old orphan. Now I pay particular attention to his Crucian roots. Um, St. Croix has a very rich history of direct action, mass struggle, history of sla capitalist slavery. Um, he's very aware, you see in his writings, even his early writings, he, he knows his African roots. He knows how African customs and tradition lessen the oppression, and writes about this, lessen the oppression of plantation life, things like communal growing, Saturday markets. But one of the key things that I focus on, I think it's important for U.S. audience, is that the color line is drawn differently in St. Croix and in the English-speaking Caribbean in general and the U.S. And by that, I mean the following. In St. Croix, there is no, when Harrison comes in 1900 to New York, in St. Croix, there's no history of lynch terror. There's no formal segregation. Um, and uh, there's a policy of promotion of a sector of the African-descended population, whereas in the U.S., the the policy is severe racial proscription. The reasons, and I go into this in the book, have to do with social control. Essentially, in St. Croix, you had 5% European, 80% black population, 15% so-called free colored. The 5% couldn't control the 95. They tried for a while, didn't work very well, to utilize the other 15%, and they did this in various ways. The principal instrument of social control was the militia, which was made up of free colored. In contrast, here in the U.S., and I draw the comparison, in Virginia, the pattern setting plantation colony, but in general in the South, the principal instrument of social control was the slave patrol, which was by definition lily white. So you have a contrast. Another marked contrast um, is in St. Croix, there's an edict of full equality, a law passed granting at least nominally full equality between free coloreds and whites in 1834. 
In the U.S., the law of the land is the Dred Scott decision. 1856-57 says no black person has any rights that a white man. So you've got this qualitative difference, and it's important because it shapes when Harrison comes, when Marcus Garvey comes from uh, Jamaica, when Claude McKay comes from Jamaica, and so many of these early Caribbean immigrants, they all comment similarly. McKay phrases it wonderfully. He says, I never encountered such a bitter racial hatred as I did when I came to this country. And uh, it's important. So I, I do pay considerable attention to Harrison's Crucian roots and his uh, Caribbean background. But when he gets here, I mean, it's a conscious decision of his to come to the U.S. And then he has to set out and, you know, car as an orphan, right? He's an orphan when he comes at 17, has to make his mark and do what he's going to do here. In New York. And he basically stays in New York. His well, life. What kind of education did he have? Did he go to college? No, no, very good question. Harrison is an autodidact, self-educated, and uh, as I've come to know him, and the other person I write about, Theodore W. Allen, who writes about the invention of the white race, was also an autodidact. I have some appre I have real appreciation. There's a tremendous integrity to these people, and they live in poverty while they pursue their intellectual interests. So Harrison um, was able to finish high school here in New York. He gets citywide honors in a few subjects. Uh, but he never goes to college a day in his life. But it was said when he, when he died, and I've been through all his papers, that he read multiple books a day. And I, 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 I actually believe that because I've seen he knew how to attack a book. He'll mark, he'll interact. He doesn't have to read the entire book. He'll go right to hone in on what he needs to get at, right? And uh, he, he read periodicals, the, the journals and newspapers of his day. He has clippings and scrapbooks. But as far as his intellectual development, one of the main ingredients in that, Two, a couple things. In St. Croix, his best friend was a fellow named D. Hamilton Jackson, who's a major figure in, in Crucian history. He leads a general strike there in 1916. But Jackson's father was the leading educator in St. Croix. So Harrison had the advantage, the benefit of a good black mentor as an educator, which is a major problem here in New York where we have this whitening of the teacher workforce, right? And all the resultant, you know, implications and complications. So Harrison had that. Then, when he comes to New York, right here on 53rd Street, St. Benedict the Moor Church, which still exists, it's on 53rd, and St. Mark's, were two meeting places before the IRT gets completed, before there's a big move to Harlem. And you would have working class black intellectuals meeting in these lyceums, people like Arthur Schomburg, who's a clerk, Johnny Bruce, one of the leading uh, journalists of his day, who's a messenger um, at St. At Benedict's and at St. Mark's, George Young, a Pullman porter who sold eight to 12,000 books. He had a stall on 135th Street. Williana Burroughs, a school teacher. Charles Burroughs, a, um, a postal worker with Harrison. They used to have study groups at three in the morning when they got off work. And Charles and Williana's son, they, they, they would pass it on to the next generation. Charles and Williana's son, Charles Burroughs and his uh, wife, Dr. Margaret Burroughs, found DuSable Museum in Chicago. So they're passing, you know, all this interest and love of learning and knowing the history and the roots, you know, on. So, but at St. Mark's and St. Ben, uh, uh, and uh, at St. Benedict's and St. Mark's, Harrison particularly refers to St. Benedict's as the germ of black racial conscious in Negro New York. He talks about the environment there where people would come and I've got some wonderful quotes when I do the presentation. I do a lot of slide presentations. But essentially what he says is, we would come there and we wouldn't mince words. We'd get right into it. We wouldn't beat the devil around the stump. We'd hit at the issues. But then we'd go out and we'd be friends afterwards because there was a real hunger, an intellectual hunger. And Harrison maintained that for the rest of his life. Yeah, you know, that, that is so key. It is very difficult today to engage in conversations without them becoming personal. Yeah. Uh, people will have a tendency to personalize the conversation, yeah. but in order you know, to, you know, the dialectic, dialectical process, you should be able to make those kind of exchanges and still remain yeah. friends because at the end of it, you both should, or whoever's involved, should walk away with a higher understanding. Right. I, I fully agree, and I think that's right. And I think Harrison understood that one other, a third component of that, which I'm sure you would be very much in accord with, is, and Harrison writes in his diary, and that's why the diary is so important. He talks about, he, st he works, he, he does work for free at um, the White Rose Home, which was a home set up by Frances Reynolds Kaiser, first black woman to graduate from Hunter College who really needs a biography, outstanding. Friend of Dunbar, Mary McLeod Bethune, Harrison, 
founding member of the NAACP executive committee. She ran a, an, a, a home in New York where black women coming from the South and the Caribbean could stay when they come to the big city. They'd have a place to stay. They could go out and work and even had child care and kindergarten for the youngsters if they had children, right? And um, so Harrison um, did volunteer work there. He taught race history classes to the adults and a, a course for the youngsters. And But he would all around the community. He's totally involved in the community. So he was an intellectual. I, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, when he lives, when he first comes to New York, he lives on West 62nd Street behind Lincoln Center in an area where primarily African-American, Afro-Caribbean, 3,500 people in five blocks, right? Then when the IRT is completed in 1904, he moves to 231 West 134th, the most densely populated block in Harlem. Uh, by the way, we have a petition underway. We might be getting 134th and Lennox named Hubert Harrison Place now. That's in the works, I think. And, um, but so Harrison was an intellectual, again, the dialectical relationship. He was of the people, and he's always out. He's, he's a great mass educator through newspapers and through soapbox oratory, but he's getting back from the community, too. And that's what makes him, as an intellectual, I think so outstanding. He never lost touch, you know, with the, the people. He wasn't one of these intellectuals on high. You know, you know, you're, you're exploding a lot of myths here because um, what what we've been taught is that there were one or two intellectuals that yeah. were, that were around at that time, and we, you know, most of us know all of their names. And from what you're saying, Hubert Harrison was uh, developing quite a few, quite yeah. a number of intellectuals. Yeah. Yeah. You had mentioned something earlier about um, maintaining the cultural roots, and I mm -hmm. you said that I was thinking of Amakal Cabral. Mm -hmm. Because that was a, who was the leader of the, the PAIGC in Guinea-Bissau, mm -hmm. and he, his theory was that you had to return to return to the source, mm -hmm. return to, mm -hmm. and that's what he used uh, when he was um, fighting against the. Uh, yeah, well, right. Just to pick up on that, um, and Harrison did have his differences with, say, some of the big leaders of his day, Booker. He was pretty close with Trotter, William Monroe Trotter, a similarity, who was one of the outstanding uh, black militant leaders of the early 20th century. But Harrison developed criticisms of um, Booker T. Washington, whom he considered a, uh, a very... Uh, what was that criticism? Uh, that, that he thought he, he... Harrison kept scrapbooks, and he had one called Subservience, and he featured Booker T. Washington there, and he, he just thought that, you know, uh, Booker T. Washington it was too um, subservient to white interest. I, in the book, I use a quote where uh, Booker T. writes uh, of Teddy Roosevelt, who was the president at the time, anything he wants done, I will do. You know, uh, you, you know one of these things, whatever he asks, I will do. Um, and, um, so ha and what happens in 1910, Booker T. goes to London and to Copenhagen and issues some statements that conditions are essentially pretty fine back home, you know. This is when lynching, segregation, disfranchisement mar the land. So Du Bois puts together, W.E.B. Du Bois puts together a group of about 40 issues, letters of protest. Harrison is working in the post office. He writes two letters to one of the New York dailies. And then Booker T. Washington had a powerful political machine called the Tuskegee machine, right? And he had Harrison summarily fired from the post office. For the remainder of his life, Harrison lived in poverty. He and his wife would have five children. They always lived in poverty after this. It's a dastardly blow. And this is part, you know, there's a new biography out trying to resurrect Booker T., but it doesn't mention things like this. I think this is also an important component. The guy who fires Harrison is named Morgan. Edward Morgan, the post office on 29th Street and 10th Avenue to this day is named after him. Postal, postal officials aren't supposed to be political, but he was quite political in this action. Harrison also developed criticisms of the talented 10th and Du Bois, right? Which is the, one of the other intellectuals I think you were referring to. At first, when the NAACP is founded right here in New York after some riots in Springfield, Illinois, people get together in New York, 1909, 1910, and in the first meetings, uh, the European Americans and African Americans come together and they, they have some meetings and reports are issued the next day in the press and this will sound a little familiar to you I think but when the reports come out some of the more pointed comments from the black participants get elided they get taken out Harrison says this is no way to start this organization right you can't shape it to white people's expectations of how black people should act. So that's his early criticism. He had started out, he, he writes in his diary, as a Du Bois man, because Du Bois and Trotter were protesting Booker T. But Harrison also took issue with the concept. Du Bois was the, the NAACP is founded. Du Bois becomes in 1910 the editor of the crisis, its publication. And um, 
Du Bois is associated with the concept of the talented tenth, those leaders of culture and, you know, who, sh who should be leaders of culture throughout the race, right? And um, he's got a very famous quote on that. And du Bois does. Now, Harrison takes issue. He says several things. One, he says the talented tenth hadn't provided the leadership that was needed. Two, that they should come down from the Mount Sinai and get amongst the people. And three, uh, that he did not agree with the notion of um, color that was implied in who that tent was. He's getting to questions of the assumption that leaders, leaders of the black community needed to have that white ancestry, within, which was the statistics that show who the talent of tenth was in his time. He wasn't mean-spirited about it, but he says we, we don't have to assume that you have to have white blood to be a leader of the Negro. And, and, like yeah. Right, right, right. That's what he and he was. He, he was very. He knew what he was talking about. He went right at it. And one other thing, if I may, um, and the, the uh, one of the unfolding stories in this first volume, and I end it, has to do with Joel Spangarn, who the NAACP still gives their award for outstanding achievement by a Black American Du Bois. I'll jump ahead on this one. Um, the NAACP. Most people associate with anti-lynching work. But they don't know that for its first 10 years plus, it refused to support federal anti-lynching legislation, which was a principal demand of Harrison and his organizations in Trotter. Why is federal anti-lynching legislation important? Because with it, you have a chance of some justice. If you leave it to local authorities, if you don't have it, you get situations like Emmett Till, where they, the, the culprits joke in the courtroom, right? But the NAACP refused to support federal anti-lynching legislation why? For the same reasons that Harrison warned about, but this is documented in a few books and I have very meticulous notes. They didn't want to alienate Southern white support, right? They were still trying to appease white sentiment in that sense. So what happens, one of the key things, and this is going towards the end of the book now, just to wrap up with the NAACP, Du Bois, and Spingarn, is um, World War I, Harrison was opponent of World War I. It's a situation we face today, again, in many respects. And his criticisms, uh, you know, he understands that the call for democracy was a sham, you know, meant to cover sordid, he says, sordid imperialist aims. He and William Monroe Trotter uh, arranged for the major black protest effort during World War I, which is called the Liberty Congress, to meet in 1918 in the last week of June. And they wind up meeting, and they have black men and women from 35 states come together. Major protest effort. Now, as they're planning for this, Jolie Spingarn sets in motion a plan to undermine it. Now, for those not familiar with Spingarn, Spingarn was the head of the NAACP, European-American. NAACP did not have black leadership its first decade, you know. Um, he was a Romance language professor at Columbia University. He was a socialist, but he's a pro-war socialist. Lenin says dividing line in the international uh, mo movement at that time was between pro-war and anti-war. One of the first big issues that comes up in World War I is the question of integrated officers training camp. According to Harrison, the black community was on the verge of winning that demand because it was a big, in the press, the black press, they were really hammering on that issue. When Spingarn, speaking on behalf of the black community, you know, as the head of the NA, says we will accept the segregated camps, right? Uh, the second big issue was this Liberty Congress. Now, Spingarn also, aside from everything else, to this day, the NAACP gives their award for outstanding achievement by a black American in his name. But Spingarn was something else. He was a major in military intelligence. That is that branch of the War Department that monitors the black and the radical community. In my book, for those who don't believe me, I have a picture of him in his military uniform, right? So Spingarn wants to undermine the anti-war effort of Trotter and Harrison. So he comes up with a plan to hold a, quote, colored editors conference to meet a week before in Washington, steal the thunder. Uh, they wind up holding it. They have more moderate editors. It's, not, it, it's an all-male affair. No women are there. And it's not an all-black affair. They have people like FDR, who at that time is the assistant secretary of the Navy and bragging about how he wrote the Constitution for Haiti, which the U.S. had occupied, right? So, um, and what happens is they, he does a little more, though. Spingarn is by W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, Du Bois does many great things in his life, but in terms of this, this is probably the, the period and the a action that he's most embarrassed of his whole life, and Harrison calls him on it, right? Is Spingarn is by Du Bois' own admission, Du Bois' closest white friend, right? And Spingarn talks to Du Bois, and Du Bois decides to do two things. One, he puts in an application for captaincy in military intelligence during World War I. He doesn't get it, but he puts it in, right? And two, he writes an editorial in July 1918, Crisis Magazine, called Close Ranks. It's only one paragraph long. I think it's probably the, par uh, the 
uh, editorial he's most embarrassed about in his entire life. It opens up, while this war lasts, let us uh, forget our special grievances and close ranks behind Woodrow Wilson's or war effort. Forget our special grievances. Everybody knew what they meant. Segregation, lynching, disfranchisement. You could have differences on the war, but you don't have to go there, right? And, of course, on the, uh, the war, Wilson had brought the U.S. into war in the name of democracy, and Harrison was very critical of that. So Harrison writes, a, uh, in his paper, The Voice, writes a critique of Du Bois, um, basically criticizing him for putting in for the captaincy and for the editorial, you know. And, so, yeah. Right, and Du Bois will never mention Harrison again. Irma Watkins Owens teaches up at Fordham, a very good uh, professor focused on Caribbean, African-American Caribbean history, and she points out that Du Bois will never mention Harrison again. So um, that jumped ahead. But, so Harrison had his differences, but Harrison, as, as we'll see in here, what he learned in those lyceums with Schomburg and Bruce and those working class intellectuals, he would criticize the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, the NAACP, the Urban League, the Amsterdam News, the Nation, you know, on and on, but invariably, as you go through them, as people go through what, what's written and we document, he's generally on mark and he's not mean-spirited, but as today, people don't handle that criticism very well, right? right. Um, one of the things I was wondering is, he started out as a historian, someone who's just doing investigations about history. How did he move from that to a radical? Well, th very good question. What happens is when he gets fired from the post office um, in 1911, he really turns to full-time work with the socials. He may have joined before, and Harrison was already moving in intellectual circles. When he starts, when he's still in high school, in 1903, starts writing letters to the New York Times. Between 1903 and 1910, he has 12 letters published including two front-page Saturday Review of Books on literary criticism. So he's writing in that. He starts moving in free thought circles. Free thought was thought unfettered by religion. It was a very big movement in the early 20th century. Leaders of the women's movement had been involved. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, Emma Goldman was a free thinker. Um, leaders in the communist movement, leaders in the socialist movement, and many important black leaders, including J.A. Rogers, Claude McKay, writers and thinkers. Even Du Bois was, was an anti-clerical. And David Le Levering Lewis writes this, although not in the biography, the quote that I use. It, it's something he wrote elsewhere. But so, the, the, and of course, the black church is the most powerful institution in the black community. So the break f uh, from religion, the turn to science to address problems, you know, from a scientific uh, approach, is both, it distances Harrison and others sometimes, you know, from the community they're trying to lead, but it also enables them to take that step forward. So there's that relationship going on. Um, so um, Harrison, when he gets fired in the post office, he turns to full-time work with the socialists. He had been in, you know, um, in and around socialism for a period of time. When he joins the Socialist Party, it's partly because of its intellectual appeal. New York was a center of intellectual socialism and he is an outstanding intellectual, but it's also because it's the self-proclaimed party of the working class. And Harrison reasons, well, gee, black people are primarily working, this should be the party for us, right? And, and the New York Times has that, that's in the New York, if people search the New York Times. So he, he was an extraordinary orator, but as a socialist theoretician, Harrison lays out in the, in the Socialist Party journals, he does series of articles in The Call, which is the newspaper, and in the International Socialist Review, which is the journal, he lays out key concepts that really shape the black left for much of the 20th century at its best, although people don't know their roots in Harrison and they pick them up from elsewhere. He argues that what we call the race national question is socio-historically, not biologically determined. He argues that the so-called Negro question, however we phrase it, is a revolutionary question. That that's the you know, central question. He argues that it's a principal duty of the European, the whites, to uh, fight white supremacy, racism, and stuff. These are at the best of the left, you know, and not just the black left, the, the U.S. left, the, you know, the, it assumes positions approaching this, right? And he does all of this, but, and he does some of it in publications that come out right before the Socialist Party convention in 1912. He writes a, um, he writes a piece called, and he opens up, and it's Southernism or Socialism? What's going to be the direction of the party? Uh, Southernism, of course, being a code word for white supremacy. You know, everyone understood what Southernism was at the time. And he lays that before in the major theoretical journal of the party, right before the convention. They go to that convention. They don't even discuss the Negro question, right? But they do discuss Asian immigration. And in the discussion on Asian immigration, the Socialist 
leaders take some of the most racist positions in the history of the left about this is a white man's party and this and that, both the minority and the majority positions, right? And the majority position, the majority position ends up uh, with something to the effect that um, class consciousness must be learned, but race consciousness is inborn. It's the racism is innate concept, which Harrison goes after throughout. You know, he's not buying that one, right? So. Um, and, and he laid it out. So when Harrison winds up leaving, in 1913, he's out at the Patterson strike with Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and Big Bill Haywood. He still continues his activism, but he moves increasingly to the left wing in the party, supportive of the IWW for a while, but they're not really in this area very much. And he winds up, by 1914, leaving the Socialist Party after he gets, there's a suspension for his, some of his talks. Um, so but, he struggled with Right, right. He struggled within the party, and here's his, his criticism as he leaves and assesses what's going on and is one of the most profound criticisms in the history of the left, I think, and one which makes it even more important that we come to know Harrison now and more regretful that we didn't know him for all these years. He says that the white socialists and the white labor movement put the white race first before class. It's very profound, I think, particularly in light of the other work I do, Theodore W. Allen, who writes on the invention of the white race and argues amongst many other things. And Allen's really worth reading in the original. Don't have him, you know, interpret it to you, anyone. <laughs> Read him yourself. And I, on my webpage, I have a lot of his writings. But Allen calls the white race this multi-class formation, the principal form of class collaboration, is, and the principal retardant to, pr to progressive democratic and socialist movements. And so there's a Har Harrison, beginning of century, Allen at the end, kind of hone in on that same centrality of the struggle against white supremacy, which part of the appeal. So what Harrison does after that, he speaks independently for a while. He's very active around 14th Street in free speech struggles. People now, you know, can speak on street corners and stuff, but they had a, he's arrested when he speaks on birth control in 1914. There's one account, he's speaking up at 181st and Broadway. If people are familiar with that subway station, you have to go down, you know, and uh, he's speaking there on birth control, 1914. And according to the account, the Irish cop looks the other way and the gang around, he's attacking him. He has to take a table leg, defend himself into the subway against a, you know, a number of people, and then he's the one who gets arrested. But so he's, he's struggling, he's struggling, he goes to Buffalo, New York, he goes to Jersey, various places where people are still, you know, they, they face arrest and he gets arrested, you know, for speaking, just public speaking on street corners, an issue which we still have today, not only with speaking, but with the vendors, you know, all the harassment that goes on. Um, so, and then he's, he's, pushed further as he develops a critique of World War I and the racial implications of the war, a few other things happen. One, he starts writing theater reviews, and these are very profound because he starts analyzing the role of black actors, the, role, the roles that they are you know, forced to play, what they can do within that context, the black playwright, because this is the early black theater, Lafayette Theater group up in Harlem, a few other groups, and he writes some reviews, and the issues he's touching are ones we know today, you know, about the black images, you know, in the media and on a stage and things like that, and he writes very perceptive analysis, which lead him to even more to the conclusion he's got to concentrate in the black community. And James Weldon Johnson writes a um, piece in the New York Age, which is the leading black daily, uh, weekly at that time. And um, Johnson says, we, you know, we need Harrison to be giving educated, uh, these outdoor talks in the community. It's like a university education, right? So, and a librarian up at the 135th Street Library, Mrs. Cohen, writes, uh, uh, you know, and, and encourages him also, and he mentions that. So he's getting these encouragements. and he starts and turns to concentrated work in the black community. And when he does, by 1916, and this is when he's still influencing the young A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen, Cyril Briggs, Richard B. Moore, all these people who are going to be major militants in Harlem and in the U.S. actually for the you know, next decades. And he decides that he's going to start building, and this is where he differs, say, from Du Bois, say, from Booker T. He says, we've got to start building this race unity but that we've got to start at the bottom, from the bottom up. And he, writes, and he writes pieces on race unity and what we need. And he says the problem with the uniters, the previous efforts, they started at the wrong end, they started at the top when they should have started at the bottom. He says light the flame at the bottom. This is where it'll you know, come. And that marks his work because he's always been very masked. He's a masked-based radical and activist. Um, and, of course, the Garvey movement you know, takes at, you know, aspects of that you know, from Harrison which maybe we can get into a little bit, Harrison and Garvey. But, so that, that's when he turns to concentrated work uh, in 1915-16 period. Did he believe that, you know, because when you say um, there will be people who will hear that, 
and say, well, he was just really, just primarily interested in the black community, uh, was, and then probably relate that to some kind of separatist movement. Yeah. Was he, did he believe in that? Or? Well, he, most of his work for his last decade plus was in all black organizations, but it wasn't because he was not, I mean, he had poured his heart out in the Socialist Party. He'd been with the IWW. He was active, thing called the Sunrise Club. They used to have these interracial, I mean, he, you know, but he thought, I, at a certain point, I think he concluded what I said. They put the white race first before class, and until they start dealing, and he, he laid it out. He says it's the principal duty of the white activists, the white socialists, and the whites in the labor movement to challenge this white supremacy. Because we'll meet you on even grounds then, you know. But it, it, he, see, one of his differences with the NAACP, I told you earlier, I mentioned earlier, was that they, they tried to shape their program to what their expectations, white's expectations of how black people should act. But Harrison, and I tied this to his Caribbean roots. In his Caribbean roots, there's this rich history of direct action mass struggle, which Harrison carries with him. He supports the IWW. He preaches armed self-defense. He, pre he supports sabotage when necessary, you know, in struggles. Um, strikes, militant strikes, general strikes. He's an advocate of all this stuff. And so in terms of the black community, what he basically says is, we can't wait around for these people to come around. We, 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 we got to do what we got to do. And that's what he seeks to build. So in 1917, he founds the first organization and the first newspaper of the New Negro Movement. And that New Negro Movement, uh, his organization is called the Liberty League and, and the newspaper is called The Voice. And it's, it demands enforcement of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, your basic civil rights legislation, federal anti-lynching legislation, which I told you, you know, which I mentioned before was a big issue, uh, ar preaches armed self-defense. Um, Robert Hill, who's the expert on the Garvey movement, says this is one of the key demands of the um, New Negro movement, which he considers the Garvey movement a component part of that New Negro movement. And it demands a political voice. When Harrison founds this, there had not been a black elected, there was no black elected officials in New York. That, that year, in November, they got the first black elected official in campaign. So, and Harrison's trying to preach, preach more political independence and let's get behind some candidates. So, um, and this movement attracts many, in the book, I do three chapters on the early growth of this movement and how so many of the leaders in Harrison's organization later become leaders in Garvey's organization. Marcus Garvey himself joined Harrison's organization. Anybody knows anything about Garvey's history, he's not one to join somebody else's organization. The story on that is basically the following. When Garvey first comes to the U.S., he's a, a follower of Booker T. Washington. He's influenced by Booker T. Washington. And he, he's on the verge of going back when W.A. Domingo brings him to see Harrison speaking on the street corner and he sees the appeal of Harrison. When Harrison calls the first mass meeting of his Liberty League, June 12th, on uh, 1917 on 132nd Street, Bethel Church, right? What happens is um, that um, Harrison's a featured speaker, uh, Adam Clayton Powell Sr., Chandler Owen, and Harrison invites up to the stage to speak Marcus Garvey, who's not listed, but Garvey speaks. So it's Garvey's first major talk, you know, public uh, presentation before a major Harlem crowd. Also, I'll just add anecdotally for those, in, you know, in this Harlem history, Harrison's newspaper, The Voice, amongst others who were distributing the paper, uh, he, he, in his papers is mentioned that as Landa Cardoza Good, who is the mother-in-law of Paul Robeson, um, has a group of, the phrase they used was society girls distributing the paper, which I assumed might include as Landa Cardoza Good, her daughter, right, or Robeson's wife. So we have some of those, you know, links, the, the, these links. And uh, so Harrison's, now also Harrison's Liberty League starts from an internationalist perspective, right? It talks about, you know, duties to people throughout the world, African peoples and other peoples of color. What's very interesting, and I have on the slides and in the book, um, a tr it had a tricolor flag. I mentioned Harrison's uh, an internationalist. The tricolor flag of the Liberty League was black, brown, and yellow. And Harrison gives two reasons for that. He says, because that's the colors we are domestically and internationally. It's kind of like a third world concept, right? Challenge to white supremacy concept. From that black, brown, and yellow, Garvey switches to the red, black, and green, which people now know today as black liberation colors. Right? But, and Harrison offers some comments on that. You know, the, the, in the beginning, um, when they were trying to figure out a name for the, for the NAACP, from what I've read, uh, one of the names that they were thinking about, they abandoned it was the National Association of 
colored peoples mm -hmm. is going to cover yeah. all right. peoples of color. Right. Um, you, you, you mentioned about um, his understanding that, that the white community had to begin to deal with its own racism. I know one of the things that I used to talk about on, on the radio all the time whenever there was a young black man who was gunned down by the police, that the demonstration that usually followed shouldn't only take place in, in the black community. Right. right. That if it's uh, an outrageous incident that has taken place, then the white community should also be outraged yeah. and hold, hold demonstrations yeah. in, in their community. Yeah. Otherwise, it just remains a, a black thing. Right, right. But, uh, you know, these murders, they should be outraged by it. Um, Harrison spoke and wrote, I mean, not only did he advocate armed self-defense, but he was hitting on issues of police brutality back then, right, in the black community particularly, right, and in his papers, his publications, and in his talks. And he, they, he also took part, now th this gets tricky, but there was part of uh, the demand to, to uh, try and have some black police officers in Harlem at the time, they had none, right? And Harrison's reasoning, I, I realize this is still a very complicated thing, but his reasoning was, well, with the black officer, we stood a slightly better chance of not getting beat over the head, right? I mean, it was that, that type thing. So they wanted to try and get some, but it, it was, it's what led, I mean, Battle was there, I think, in 1911 and stuff, but there was a, another one, a fellow named Holm. There were some issues with that, but Harrison's paper um, would advocate, you know, for doing something to, to challenge the white supremacist actions of the police force, too. So, so his, his relationship to Marcus Garvey, Marcus, I'm, I'm surprised to find out that, uh, that Marcus Garvey was a part of his organization. Yeah, Garvey joins, and in the book I do... Um, the second volume, this is volume one, by the way, of a two-volume biography. I, if I didn't mention, this is the first multi-volume biography of an Afro-Caribbean, only the fifth of an African-American after those of Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes, and Martin Luther King, Jr. So Harrison's being treated as a giant. The book went through five printings last year alone. It comes out in paper tomorrow. They're printing it in paper tomorrow. Um, and it's gotten wonderful reviews, both from the leading scholars, but the leading activists. Yeah, Bill Fletcher, black commentator, and many other things. Uh, the Black Agenda Report people, Bruce Dixon did a nice piece. Gene Bruskin, the head of U.S. Labor Against the War. We've had the, all the talks with, in the unions, in the libraries. Harrison was a great proponent of free public libraries, so I try and make it a point. And he used to speak at the libraries all the time, so we did the, the why, the libraries, um, you know, the universities, take, take them all over. Yeah, sorry. Well, what benefit would a knowledge of Hubert Harrison have for today? Well, very good question. And I, I think, wh what I think is very important, first, as I mentioned earlier, the type of critical independent thinking that he encourages is important. He, he, he himself was an independent critical thinker and he tried to encourage that amongst the masses. He thought it was in their interest. He wanted more political independence you know, for the black community, and, 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 you know, well, he was first, you know, he wanted, he first he wanted to advocate socialism, but when that one wasn't working very well, when he was focusing in the black community, he wanted more political independence, not being tied, back then, it was tied to the Republican Party, right, and he uh, did a number of talks on Lincoln versus Liberty, which we can talk about, and, and got into that, but what I think is probably most cru crucial about Harrison, well, there's several things more, one is the, the critical independent thinking, two, Two is Hubert Harrison focused on the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy, which is important. People want social change. They want something approaching socialism, more egalitarian society. He understood in the context of the U.S., this is the issue we've got to take them on on because they, they rely on it and they focus on it. In terms of the black community, I think his emphasis on building unity from the bottom up has much to offer. Um, and um, he, he was basically very, you know, although he'd speak and criticize, it was not, not mean-spirited, and he, so he worked with a lot of different groups. He worked with broad, you know, sector of peoples, too, you know, all over. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for now. The name of the book, Hubert Harrison, The Voice of Harlem Radicalism, uh, someone who's considered, be, considered to be the father of Harlem.